Welcome back. And I also want to ask you where you are. Can you uh, put this in the comments? Uh, we saw guys from Warsaw, we saw Vladimir from Ukraine. I hope you are in, uh, everything is very good. And where our next speaker is, he is in California. Uh, yeah, hello. <laughs> Um, I am impressed uh, reading this uh, description and who is our speaker. He's 23 years in IT. He has an Apple thread postcard, uh, work as a host. He's Apple platform evangelist. And uh, as you see, very nice and cute person. <laughs> Dennis, how, what is the weather? Um, yeah, so... Uh... First of all, good evening for those of you who are in Europe. It's uh, like great morning here in California. We have uh, sunny weather. We will probably have a heat wave today, but uh, hopefully that will not affect our um, talk here. Um, yeah, so that's probably it from the <clears throat> uh, from the weather side. There is nothing much happening here at uh, this time. It's usually hot and sunny and nothing else obviously and uh, uh, yeah so what's uh, how's going on guys yeah I see also see the people uh, responding there so good evening to all of you and uh, hopefully you will s learn something interesting in uh, our probably last talk for today right you are uh, yes you are the last but after your talk, we will uh, have a quiz where the best of you will, uh, three, three, the best of you will get uh, digital uh, prizes. Dennis, um, what you will share about today? So what we will be talking, um, we will talk about the WWDC, that's the Apple's uh, annual developer conference and specifically we will talk about all the announcements which well I considered important for the developers in this year so there were a lot of stuff happening uh, in June and uh, we just could not fit everything which was announced during the five year for, sorry five day conference into uh, one hour talk but uh, we tried to find a couple of interesting things which might affect us developers uh, and uh, we will try to see how we can use that in our day-to-day -day activities. Sounds exciting. Please. Okay, let's start. Um, so let me, yeah. So again, a couple of words about myself. Uh, I have already told a lot about that. Yes, I'm uh, Apple Platform Evangelist. For many years, I'm promoting all the stuff happening on Apple platforms and how we can leverage that uh, in our own uh, development uh, procedures. I'm leading Apple competency at IPAM. And yes, it's uh, already 23 years in IT and uh, 12 of those are in mobile. And yeah, as I uh, so said, I'm uh, hosting Apple Treats podcast, which is actually can be interesting for those of you who are looking into Apple development, but uh, with not too many technical stuff, but rather some fun uh, time. And uh, hopefully maybe in coming month, we will get, get another episode. So yeah, uh, probably enough with those uh, advertisements of the podcast. Let's talk about WWDC. Um, WWDC is uh, Apple's annual conference. Uh, it was held uh, usually for the five for five days uh, offline. So there were people gathering at various locations uh, in San Francisco, then in San Jose. But then it uh, was switched to online format for a couple of years. And these last two years, they had conference in mixed format. So there was first day with the uh, keynote announcements uh, when some of lucky developers were able to visit Apple Park and the rest of the conference was online for, again, a total of five days where there were a lot of technical sessions, ability to contact uh, Apple engineers, 
on the labs or one-on-one -on -one sessions and you're able to ask questions on the uh, new technologies and on the use of like old technologies there. So we won't be talking about all of that stuff, uh, the, the labs and everything. Let's just focus on the announcements which were made during this year's conference. What we will be discussing. So we will start with uh, Swift macros, which is kind of interesting topic which uh, powers a lot of other stuff like observation api swift data framework previews and then we will switch to some other topics uh, which will start with watchOS 10 and um, it's not too much of the technical changes there but rather the design language uh, is changed a lot and that might affect you as a developers because you will probably have to do something with that we will talk about the widgets and uh, how they now become interactive then we will talk a little bit about the inter interoperability between Swift and C++ and uh, why that might be important for you. Uh, we will talk about some new strange um, frameworks which Apple did announce. And again, we will try to understand if that affects us somehow. And yes, we will finally talk about the uh, Apple Vision Pro, spatial computing and uh, uh, what we need to know about that so like what's new in ar kit in swift ui and uh, what's new in shareplay okay let's get started um, we will start with swift macros so probably you all know that swift was uh, famously lacking this feature for many years and uh, now you can see it's uh, being announced and implemented what's uh, what important about macros is uh, they are type safe. And uh, moreover, the macros which you create for Swift, they are actually created in Swift. So this um, might be a little bit different if you ever seen macros in C, where you basically could do whatever you want. Here is a little bit different. And this uh, requires you uh, to write a lot of code, but this code will uh, be well it will help you to remove the magic from the compiler so apple already used the macros to make some stuff which were like basically magic keywords in the compiler and they are now implemented is as macros um, in order to run these macros uh, you will need to create a compiler plugin so this is um, a little bit tricky to understand at first so you need to create separate package you need to um, uh, develop a lot of uh, code in order to make this macro work and uh, then you will be able to attach uh, these uh, macros to some places in your code again it's not uh, like you, you will be able to create absolutely everything you have some macros which you can just put whenever you want like freestanding macros or you can attach macro to something like class or struct or property of the class or something else and these macros also will be able to emit errors and warnings in Xcode. So like if you are a great macro developer, you will be able to create uh, warnings or uh, errors if macro is not applied properly or the parameters for the macros are not correct and they do not correspond to the code which you try to attach that macro to. And uh, Xcode will also provide you with an option to expand the code and see how actually resulting source code looks like after this macro was applied to your source code. So in order to define the macro, you're basically using, as I said, it's just a Swift um, with a couple of uh, new uh, keywords, like you define the macro definition with public macro and you have the definition of what this macro is. So it's like freestanding uh, free expression. So it basically will look like a function, uh, but it, Actually, it will be a macro. And uh, what particular this macro is actually doing is uh, it will take the code you pass to it and create string out of it. And then you basically implement this macro in a way uh, like you create uh, standard st uh, swing uh, swift structs or classes or anything. So you basically take the... Um, macro and implement it and you use uh, syntax which uh, uh, is provided by swift syntax uh, module so let's see how it works yeah you see the observable macro being applied to the class which is looks like a 
simple class with simple properties with nothing else. But after uh, compiler does its thing, uh, this trans, uh, transforms into this kind of um, code. There, there are different things which are added there and there are additional macros applied there. And uh, as you can see, there are a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes, but you just needed to apply that macro. So that's all cool and interesting and you potentially might want to start uh, creating your own macros, but let's see what these macros already powering us. Observation, this is something which was introduced now for probably specifically for the Swift UI because you can use that without Swift UI, but it also um, very powerful in Swift UI context. So you're using macros to create a data uh, change tracking. So as soon as your object changes, the Swift UI view can be uh, refreshed. So that's probably the main purpose there. Um, how to work with the observation API? That's again, quite simple. You use observable macro and that's it. You don't need any published properties. If you remember those uh, observable objects, uh, observable object protocol or something like that. So no need for that. You just apply the macro and that's it. And only the properties uh, uh, which are you, which you access from your Swift UI view, uh, only changes to those properties will actually trigger uh, the update of the of the view. So not not the whole object, but only those who are only those properties which were actually needed to construct your view. So that's again a very um, very interesting approach, and. Uh, how it does, so you, how, how you do that, you basically take your class, you mark it with observable macro, and that's probably it. You don't need anything else here. Um, you can use your own approach to uh, look for changes, so you can use with, uh, with observation tracking on change method, or you can basically use um, Swift UI. Uh, if you use previous um, uh, object tracking APIs, like everything else, you, you will probably need to some kind of migration steps. And for that, you basically use a couple of standard steps. So instead of environment object, you will use environment. Instead of state object, you use just state for classes. Yes, that's uh, maybe a little bit confusing if you, you, if you were looking into a previous approach, but here you just uh, use that. And if you were used observed object, you just remove that property wrapper altogether. Uh, bindable, new um, uh, property wrapper is uh, used for two-way binding. So you, uh, observation will uh, basically update the views, but it will not uh, uh, allow you to modify that in, in a proper way. So you will need bindable in order to uh, allow two-way binding. And there is some uh, interesting thing regarding for each or least behavior. You uh, will now probably want to create um, separate view structs for contents of those uh, for each or least view uh, uh, iterators. So the, it's being documented, but if you won't do that, you might see that sometimes this observation tracking is not working as you would expect. But keep in mind that uh, this is something you will need to look for. Okay, so that's the observation. Powerful feature built on top of Swift macros. Now let's talk about the Swift data. Um, those of us who uh, develop iOS applications know about the core data framework. You know, it's a, a framework to keep your data in usually a SQL-like database, but you probably can do something else. And it's famously less Swift as you want it to be. So it's really, really objective C framework. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And um, Apple finally um, decided to work something around that. They created Swift data. Again, macro-based persistence framework. Uh, well, let's say it has core data roots. We can go even further and say it's basically somewhat a new front end for the core data. But um, that also means that you can use both core data and uh, Swift data in the project and you can migrate your existing core data code to Swift data gradually and you will not need to do that in uh, one sitting and uh, therefore that probably might help you with the, with the upgrade process. Um, 
So what we will see next, uh, let's see how we actually use Swift data in your uh, applications. We take a simple class. So as you can see, there is no NS managed objects there. There is nothing there. You just mark your class with uh, model macro. You add a couple of other macros for the attributes, for example, for uh, to make the attribute as being unique, like basically the key, or you mark uh, your relationship or you mark some properties as transient, so they will not be stored in the database. How do you use that? You um, create a model container uh, in SwiftUI, uh, which is basically sets the environment for your views and it uh, sets up the whole Swift data, or we rather could say like Swift data slash core data stack uh, behind the scenes. So you don't need to do anything else. Um, it, it will basically take care of everything. And then you just uh, use new uh, property wrapper, which is called query. Um, you pass the uh, sort object, uh, sort parameters, and uh, that's basically it. You you get all the trips from the uh, from the database. And uh, again, as, as you can see, it's just a trip class, which is basically standard Swift class. There is nothing there. Another important thing regarding the Swift data, and that's something many um, iOS developers were struggling with in core data, is that the predicates, so if you want to search for the specific uh, element in the in the database, you write that in not type safe code. So you write that as basically a string format when you pass the parameters, and there are a lot of chances that you will mess up something. So predicates here also uh, done by macros, and you can use uh, uh, standard Swift code here, and that's again really helps uh, to avoid issues. And uh, it's still performant and it still works pretty fine. So um, we can use that in uh, in our applications and avoid potential issues with the string uh, uh, predicates which we had previously. Okay, great feature. What next? The previews. Um, since the SwiftUI introduction, previews were really praised by the developers because you don't need to build the whole app, you don't need to run it, you need to you don't need to go to the specific place of your application to see how your view will actually look like. And uh, a lot of people were associating SwiftUI as uh, with the preview. So like you know, why like the, for the question like why why would you use SwiftUI? Like yeah, because we can use previews and that's why it's better than UIKit. Well, um, new previews are, you probably already understand, they are based on the macros now. And um, moreover, now they support UI key, uh, kit views. And that's actually great addition. And now we can use this powerful mechanism for your Swift UI views and UI kit views. And yes, while we all really want to use Swift UI everywhere, we potentially still have some UI kit code which we still need to support or uh, it covers some specific cases which are uh, not that easy to express in SwiftUI. So great, a great feature for, for all of us. And as uh, the previous preview mechanism, it also supports all kinds of custom, uh, customizations and um, all, all we want to have. However, uh, as with all previous features, it will require minimum target of iOS 17 and macOS Sonoma. So, while it's just the debug mechanism previews, they only uh, they are not actually published into the application on the App Store. It will still require you to have this uh, build target of iOS 17 in order to have previews working. So this is kind of a setback, but potentially you can have a separate target with the iOS 17 for the previews and a separate target for uh, for the publishing. But keep in mind that. Okay, so how how we use that? Well, it's again quite simple. We uh, uh, use the pound preview uh, macro and put our views there or your controllers. That's uh, as simple as that. There is nothing much to do there. Let's talk now about uh, watchOS. So enough with macros, right? Uh, let's let's talk about the watchOS. And interestingly, uh, we will not be talking much about code here as well. What was changed in Swift, uh, oh, sorry, in watchOS um, is the approach to the screen. Um, previously, Apple was relying much on the horizontal navigation. So you were swiping screens on your Apple Watch left and right, and that was uh, probably more or less okay. 
With this release, Apple more focuses on the vertical scroll. And so basically you will be using um, digital crown for that as well. So you can scroll with the fingers, but it will probably uh, be easier to scroll with digital crown. And the whole application uh, will be split into screens. And um, another thing which is important here is that the screens should not be like bound to the screen physical size. You can have screen which will, will be scrolled within the size, but then it will scroll to the next screen um, uh, in a row. So if you are Apple Watch developer, you potentially want to have this um, in your mind when you will be designing your application or maybe even put redesign as the uh, like something which you put, will put on your uh, backlog because the new approach will be applied to the whole operating system by Apple and if your app stands out then you will be probably getting some negative user feedback there um, and what you can see here is like basically everything is now um, vertical screens and you will see dots near the uh, digital crown they um, will show the like uh, amount of screens or at least uh, you will see that there are many screens there and you will be able to switch them using digital crown and uh, uh, the same goes for uh, the um, your I don't know typical um, watch face so now it will have uh, widgets there and that's actually an interesting thing so previously Apple had the clock kit as the um, approach to develop uh, your complications for uh, watch faces so you can customize uh, customize watch face by providing uh, some uh, complications which will show your applications data there now these complications are migrated to the uh, widget kit framework and moreover there is a smart stack widget which is coming from the iphone but if you remember there was a so-called uh, siri um, watch face so i think Apple like gradually sunsetting that watch face in favor of these widgets which you can add probably to any other uh, watch face there. So again, if you're creating widgets for an iPhone and you uh, happen to have um, Apple Watch app, it will be quite an easy migration and you will be able to use that uh, all of them together. And with that, let's basically talk about widgets. Uh, they were introduced quite recently and they were famously uh, Static. Uh, you were able to tap the widget and you um, can, could trigger some action or open the application basically uh, for that. Apple now expanding functionality of widgets and um, now they could be interactive. You can add actions uh, which could be triggered by the tap of the widget. So you can have a button on the widget and they will trigger action which could be performed by your application in the background. Uh, what does uh, does that mean? Um, that you will be able to uh, present the widget which will look like it's interactive. So you press a button and something happens on the widget directly. Uh, the widget itself still is quite static. It's still um, being rendered and uh, saved as the images and then images presented to the user. But you now in control of the animations which will be applied to those changes. So again, that's kind of an interesting approach. From the user perspective, widgets will be like a application screen on their um, uh, home screen on the phone or on their watch. Um, but internally, they will be quite limited to what they were before. You will use a link element to trigger actions in your application and uh, you will use app intents uh, in order to execute those actions. So you will, you will need to define your actions in your app uh, uh, and you will need to use link in order to uh, control those actions. And you, uh, so this uh, widget kit frameworks, it also has uh, something to do with li uh, live activities which uh, were introduced uh, quite recently. And yes, as I said, Apple Watch widgets, they are also uh, getting this functionality uh, with, uh, with the expansion of widget kit to the Apple Watch. Um, again, how we do that, we define the intent, uh, which will be triggered by uh, a widget. That's, uh, uh, these intents might be familiar with you, uh, to you if you were trying to integrate with the shortcuts or Siri kit uh, in, uh, recently with the new app intent framework. And 
if you actually uh, decided to migrate your uh, clock kit complications to widget kit there are some uh, simple approaches there so you there are standard uh, complication families they are mapped to the widget families and uh, they are more or less uh, uh, you, it's quite easy to understand what they're actually doing and just keep in mind that um, Apple watch screen is much smaller and therefore you should be um, placing uh, interactive elements very carefully in order to avoid um, user being uh, being unable to tap something because it's too small so just keep in mind that okay uh, this this is actually quite interesting topic C++ uh, Apple finally making C++ and Swift working together and they are making them very uh, Apple way in, in terms of how they communicate. So Objective-C and Swift were already communicating in many ways, but now it's, there is a built-in conversion for the vectors like arrays or anything, strings and classes. Um, so you will be able to use those from Swift, uh, like C++ class, you will be able to use that from Swift and you will be able to use uh, Swift classes or uh, strings from C++. And this default printing still might need some kind of your attention in order to make it proper, like uh, you will need to work on the uh, all the things um, in, uh, like basically how the memory management works, uh, how, what properties are visible and what are not visible, and you, you can use the, uh, the uh, directives in order to make that happen but again just keep in mind that after the default bridging you will still need to see how it works and Apple um, talk, uh, talks about that on their WWDC talk how to make that beautiful so you will have like nice uh, conversion between these two worlds and they will be able to work together and yes as I said it's a two-way bridging it's not just you will be able to use uh, C++ from Swift but you will be able to use Swift uh, from C++ which is kind of interesting and expect more changes happening in this um, more uh, like in upcoming years so they probably will improve a lot of stuff in terms of uh, built-in conversions and some things might be um, much easier to use in the future so how, how, how you mix those things, you um, define your uh, C++ things there and then you import those into Swift and you can add an uh, extension to those classes or structs, they are, they are visible as structs and you can use them like basically as you would use any uh, regular Swift code or you can use them even uh, more complicated like you will be using something in uh, C++ or use uh, enumeration in uh, Swift or you can use any uh, random access collection methods uh, on, on these things coming from C++. So um, from the development perspective that's actually kind of fun because you will be able to use much more uh, libraries which are created in C++ in your iOS or any uh, other Apple platform projects and that's great and you will be able to share your Swift libraries to other developers and they will be able to use that in their projects which are not related to Apple platforms right now which is a great expansion for the Swift language and great uh, uh, great help for the Apple developers so they will be much it will be much easier for them to use standard um, APIs from other platforms. Okay, let's probably speed up a bit because we I think uh, are running out of time. Let's talk about the new feature which is Apple TV continuity camera. Essentially, you will be able to use iPhone camera on Apple TV and you will be able to um, I don't know, have a large screen of your uh, TV set and the camera, for example, to make a, I don't know, a FaceTime call or any Zoom call or any other messaging app. And you as a developer has, uh, ha will have um, an API to that. So it's uh, kind of easy. You will be using the all existing APIs, which you probably already see on um, your um, iOS platform. It's a AV foundation and it will be almost the same. The only thing you need to uh, remember that the camera can uh, connect or disconnect uh, because that's the basically uh, separate from the device and you will need to track those events and uh, uh, respond accordingly. 
And uh, also there is a new class introduced there as a EV continuity device, which will basically mark the device which is, uh, can be connected or disconnected. And those will apply to microphone and the cameras because they both will be available to you. Again, handling the connections is quite easy. It's just uh, you will need to um, implement a method on, on the delegate. Next, dock kit, which is kind of fun. Uh, the Apple announced that there will be motorized dock for the uh, iPhone available and uh, you're able to put your iPhone on that dock and it will be able to control il uh, its position. It will be basically rotating it in, uh, across the world and you will be able to, for example, use that to track somebody in the camera frame. So you will be able to walk across the room and the iPhone will follow you. That's the basically dock kit API. And uh, together with capture session, that will be much easier to do. So you will be able to uh, create an application which will uh, stream the video, but it will uh, use the, this motorized dock in order to keep you always in frame. And it's kind of, um, simple to do that manually. So you basically will be able to <laughs> direct camera uh, on your phone manually, or you can use the AV session uh, uh, using tracking. So you will be able, for example, put some uh, frame which you want to track and uh, allow everything to do uh, automatically. So it will basically track the, uh, the required object uh, automatically while you uh, just record the, the video. Uh, standby mode. Um, that's another great framework. Uh, what, you, what it requires, you need to put your iPhone on the charging in landscape mode and you will have the full screen available to you uh, for your widgets. And that's, pro for example, you can use as, as a night, nightstand or you can uh, use that when you are working and the iPhone shows your calendar for that and so on. Uh, and there is another interesting thing. So each MagSafe charger will uh, remember its configuration. So for example, if you put your uh, phone on the charger in your um, uh, work desk, it will show your work widgets and on your night desk, it will show you, I don't know, uh, photos from the day or something like that. And uh, you can switch those widgets uh, or you can have, even have multiple of those. And um, there will be some changes in order to make them um, uh, adjust to the screen size of the rotated iPhone. So just keep in mind that you will need to uh, adjust your widgets for those dimensions. And all of that stuff like camera, dock kit, standby, like, do you think it's a coincidence that we will see them all together here? I'm still thinking that there is a opportunity for new home devices from Apple, like something which will have a camera, a screen, and uh, it will probably be controlling uh, your home, maybe, but there are no announcements yet. So again, having all these APIs all together, if you study them and you will be ready, probably your application will be first on the market to uh, be ready for that kind of new uh, home devices, if they actually uh, announced. Okay, speaking of new devices, finally, let's talk about the, these shiny new Apple Vision Pro. Uh, yes, it was announced on the first day of WWDC. It, there were a lot of talks about this device previously and uh, Apple, uh, Apple uh, enthusiasts were expecting it much earlier, but now uh, Apple finally shows that. It's actually an interesting device. They're calling them as the spatial, personal spatial computing device. Um, but what essentially Apple Pro is, it's a device which will, yeah, as I said, uh, provide you with the spatial computing capabilities. The, the thing or that you will be able to work uh, using this uh, uh, device in your room, not just bound to one particular screen. You will have all the space around you for your information, for your applications and for your uh, um, entertainment purposes. It will be available next year uh, and the prices will start in uh, three and a half thousand dollars and that's without taxes and without any attachments or, or anything. So expect higher uh, price tag overall. And initially it will be available in US, but probably uh, later in the year it will be available in other countries too. The device will be personalized. So uh, the 
there are uh, the, the light seals, so the, the connection to the screen, or sorry, to, to your face will be uh, interchangeable. There will be lenses which uh, uh, you will be able to use uh, and uh, those will probably cost you additional uh, money there. And the way you will be working with this is actually um, kind of futuristic a bit, but uh, you will, as Apple said, so the, the whole world around you is now your uh, potential screen uh, real estate. So you will be able to put your windows uh, around you. You will be able to communicate with all of those. And the communication way uh, is kind of interesting. So what we will be able to use there we will be able to use uh, existing iOS and iPadOS applications with some exceptions. Apple uh, outlines that some frameworks will not be available on Apple Vision Pro and uh, uh, some of them it's actually kind of interesting to see, but uh, we, we will talk ab about that a little bit. And you will be able to put your MacBook screen, just take it from your MacBook and put it uh, somewhere in the space as well. That's um, also a great option. So you will be able to use applications which are running directly on the Apple Vision Pro and the applications which are running on your MacBook. Um, Apple promises that uh, the device will have 90 hertz uh, refresh rate and it might be increased if you're displaying specific content which uh, needs more synchronization. So at least 90 hertz, but could be more for some entertainment content. And the main thing which you need to know is like basically it's everything controlled by eyes and your hand gestures and voice. You don't need any controller. So you can kind of um, could remember when the initial iPhone was introduced when like you don't need stylus in order to control it. So it's kind of the same moment here when we everything is controlled by your um, uh, basically by your hands or eyes or um, that, that's it. So you, you look at the element and you pinch your fingers. And by the way, the fingers should not be in your eyesight. They could be on your laps or anything. The, the device has a lot of cameras which look into all, 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 all of the places around you. And speaking of this uh, uh, eye tracking in the cameras, you do not have access to eye tracking or cameras which are looking outside as a developer. That's done specifically for the uh, privacy reasons because there are a lot of cameras and they look outside and in order to prevent this uh, data like accidentally leaking to somewhere, you as a developer are not able to get the stream. The only camera you can have is actually a virtual camera which will, which will display the user's face for, for example, for the FaceTime uh, to uh, calls or something like that. But keep in mind that this is uh, these are the limitations so far. Something might be changed in the future, but uh, uh, this is what we will see at the release of the device. Okay, quickly, uh, how we develop the applications. We have uh, plain windows, like 2D windows, and we have volumetric windows, which are kind of interesting in a way. So the plain window is just similar window, but it will be just floating somewhere in your room. Uh, volumetric window will have size, like uh, for example, it will have a 3D object there placed and you can go around that and see it from different angles. With immersive spaces, um, it's kind of more interesting because in, instead of just having a window or which is uh, bound by its uh, frame, you will have uh, all space around you available to your application and you will be able to put any 3D content there and can even put user into the space and you will basically uh, hide everything else. So the user will see only the virtual content there. There will be some safeguards in order to prevent a user from uh, getting uh, stuck with some, uh, like I don't know, uh, if it comes too close to, some, uh, to something or it, the person will approach him. So in that case, this immersive experience will fade out and uh, the device will be able to tell the, the user that there is some kind of danger around and he need to respond to that. So the development is quite simple. You can use the native development uh, tools uh, like Swift UI or UIKit, you're, you're there. Uh, or you can use Unity. Um, and for now, there is no support for Unreal Engine and we don't know if we, it will actually come soon or, um, or when, you know, and it all depends on Epic uh, to provide that uh, support. And they did, did not uh, announce anything yet. In order to create content, you can use any uh, 3D model uh, editor like Blender 
and you will be using USDZ open format for that. And um, Apple provided a couple of tools to convert from other formats into USDZ and uh, uh, composer tools which are, uh, allow you to compose multiple objects into the scene which you can put to the device. So these tools are quite usable even for those who are not really familiar with 3D and they can basically, like, if you're just a developer and you want to put some 3D content to your application, you will be able to use them and you will be able to publish an app without having 3D artists uh, guiding through that. So you will just need to get the proper model. You probably can buy it or you um, can use something available uh, on the internet. And uh, then you will be able to place it properly, adjust it, uh, adjust the lighting parameters or physics, and then you will be able to create an application without being 3D artist. And these tools are actually quite uh, simple to use. As I said, you will be able to access them um, quite, proper, uh, quite, quite easily. Okay, I think we, uh, we need to speed up a little more. Let's talk about the uh, ARKit. The ARKit for uh, VisionOS is different from ARKit for iOS. Um, it provides you with a couple of uh, important comp uh, capabilities. So plane detection, scene reconstruction, tracking, including hand tracking and image tracking. And interestingly, it has full C API support. So you, it's not just Swift or Objective-C, it has pro proper Swift, oh, so proper C API, which you can use from your applications. Um, so the uh, it's interesting in, ter in terms of it for Swift, it's based on the protocols and uh, it has similar anchor concepts as it was in iOS, but the hand tracking is tailored to the vision OS experience because the hand tracking there is quite important. So uh, all other stuff are quite similar. Swift UI is now also updated for the 3D uh, usage. You use uh, the similar things, but you now have immersive space as the way of creating fully uh, virtualized environment. Uh, and uh, you can use the volumetric windows, which are basically 3D windows, which now have width, height and depth. And you, uh, the uh, dimensions you, uh, you now specify in like meters or I don't know, foot or uh, feet or something, uh, something else which you would like, not just pixels. Apart from that, you just use reality view, put your content there and that's regular Swift UI view, which you will typically use. SharePlay is also updated for the Vision OS in order to make it happen like you're talking to the people uh, around you, standing nearby you. Uh, participants will appear as a, a special personas and you will be able to work on the shared context altogether. Um, so you will basically see something like this. They, um, they said that we expect something to happen uh, soon and these images will be updated and uh, we will see that in, a, uh, in our upcoming beta versions. So there are a couple of templates where people stand and look into the, the same screen or the same whiteboard, or they stand around an object and discuss that, or they stand nearby the, the content and they are just talking and the content is nearby. So these are three uh, typical templates for the shared play experiences. You as a developer might need to work on that. And finally, let's talk a little bit about what you should do next. Um, so. As a developer, you definitely need to start trying new macros in your Swift projects. You definitely need to start adopting observable macro because very soon the iOS 17 will be the target for your applications. And this approach to tracking changes is much easier and much uh, more straightforward than the previous one. You need to evaluate the Swift data. It's not that you will need to migrate it soon, but um, again, uh, these new predicates are quite interesting and it's better to, to be ready to migrate to Swift data as soon as possible because it will prevent you from many errors uh, in your applications. And yes, if you are looking into bringing your applications to uh, VisionOS, you need to go into ARKit, RealityKit and uh, try to understand how it works. And yes, it's time to build your spatial uh, computing applications because I think this uh, whole thing will be exploding very, very soon. And uh, we uh, as a developers could be the first on the platform and uh, that will uh, help us to be uh, probably noted by the, uh, by the overall uh, user base, which will be getting more and more with uh, in next year. Thank you very much. I hope you had some fun he uh, things here and uh, probably it's time for some questions.
Thank you. Um, this is very interesting uh, to to have the person who just uh, boil the, those uh, announcements. And yeah, that was uh, not that easy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it, and uh, audiences appreciate it too. This has become uh, much more clear how to use it. <clears throat> we have uh, we have two questions. So time for two questions. Uh, the first is, I also very interested in this question. How do you think that uh, how uh, what effect will Apple Vision Pro will have on? Right. AR, VR industry overall. So I think um, there are a lot of skepticism like on um, on the many portals in terms of if that will be like affecting much the industry or it will be something like MetaQuest devices or anything. From my perspective, Vision Pro has two important things which other um, companies don't. So first of all, the screens, which are extremely high resolution and extremely um, high in terms of uh, like high contrast and like the, basically all the people who are wearing this device saying that you still understand that this is coming from the computer but you are feeling it as like you're looking through the glass of those uh, uh, Vision Pro headsets and you're getting this uh, magic quite quickly so you're you're feeling that you're in the in the place and you're not looking to the screen, but you're looking through that screens and uh, you see the, the world around you. And the second thing which is important is the gesture control, which does not require you uh, um, like basically holding your hands uh, high and like touching something in the air. You you just look and you I know, pinch or you do some other hand gestures, which are more subtle and you are you, you will be able to use that and your hands will not be tired of that. So these two things make this device quite important. The price is high. I mean, that's true. But we kind of expect that Apple will first create the Pro device, but then they will create some more consumer friendly devices in coming years. And then with the mm -hmm. more adoption, that will definitely be more, more and more um, users there. And that will in turn affect other companies. So I would expect that uh, uh, Meta with their Quest devices, maybe Magic Leap with their and even Microsoft with the HoloLens will follow the trend and they will try to uh, adjust the capabilities of their devices, improve the video, uh, the, the video quality, the, maybe the gesture control will be improved and so on and so on. So we kind of expect that overall the industry will, um, will follow the trend here and we will see much better experience on, on all platforms. This is, thank you for your expertise. This is such a, um, such a kind of understanding and uh, thank you for sharing this. Um, one more question that uh, you are the host of Apple Threads podcast. When we should expect the next okay. episode? Yeah, so um, we kind of get that questions from time to time. We hoped to have this episode in July and then now we're hoping to have this episode recorded in uh, August. So I will be consulting with my co-host and we will be trying to build or to bring new episode uh, in August. We still have two weeks uh, in August in order to make it so uh, hopefully the next episode will be in August but uh, yeah we we know that we are long overdue with that. Let's assume that that was our uh, summer vacation. And uh, now we will get back to producing episodes like probably in um, one in a month uh, schedule. Thank you. Uh, Thank I'm you. thinking maybe something to share uh, this uh, podcast, but you can just uh, check it yeah. and Google it. Yeah. And uh, one we, more we, question. Okay. We, we, we just uh, had one more question. Uh, does EPAM plan to project with Apple Vision? Um, well, we are definitely exploring Apple Vision for like since uh, it was introduced and even a little bit earlier than that, we kind of expected it to happen. And uh, we definitely will have some projects uh, with the uh, internal and with our customers as well. So this is already happening. That's as much as I can tell you here. Perfect. Um, do you have a time to answer one more yes. question? Let's, yes. let's, let's do that. Uh, this is a 
Summer, W A W. What do you think there will be a future with the cross platform frameworks with Apple Vision, or will it only be possible on Swift? Okay, so Apple. let's. Mm -hmm. Let's unpack this question. First of all, we already have a cross-platform framework, Unity, as the thing which we can use on Apple Vision Pro. Uh, but if we want like, to have uh, those which we consider like Flutter and React Native, they both, I think, already announced that they have some kind of support running on Vision uh, Pro. The only thing I would like to highlight here that the, um, in order to make it proper, it's not just you need to draw something, but you need to follow the design guidelines. And these frameworks will need to be updated in order to follow these guidelines. So, for example, the eye tracking is not happening within your application context. It happens like on top of your application. And that should be done, should be supported by this framework. So these elements should be exposed to the eye tracking uh, through the accessibility APIs and so on. On the other hand, the, the cross-platform framework, which translate your application into native UI, they will probably be okay. That's more or less. However, just adding one uh, step uh, to that, uh, if you plan a, a Vision OS application right now and you want to be one of the first who was entering the market, it's better to like be uh, create this application as much. Uh, with as much attention to your user experience as possible because well this is the first time the device is entering the market and if you are providing an application which is not following the guidelines it has some uh, visible artifacts in terms of how it renders well that will be the something user will notice and they will probably remember that so at least for upcoming year or two let's just try to make these applications perfect so the user will remember you as those who are creating the perfect applications for them so that's my take here but again i i definitely expect uh, cross platform frameworks being being available for uh, apple vision pro i just <laughs> share that audience loves you and, and thank you a lot thank we you have a break We have a break, uh, 10 minutes, and uh, we will uh, just get ourselves ready for a quiz to win um, the digital certificates for education. See you in 10 minutes. Bye.